Hi, I'm Lauren Sapala, and I'm here today to talk about the INFJ door slam. Um, I wanted to talk about this topic because I get so many emails about it, and I also get a lot of questions in my classes. Um, no matter what the class I'm teaching is about, whether it's about writing or intuition or energy work, someone somewhere along the way asks the INFJ door slam question, specifically, what do I think about it? Um, and why do we do it? Now, I wanted to tackle this subject because there's actually quite a bit of material online about the INFJ door slam. Um, if you look around, it is defined as the INFJ suddenly cutting off all contact with a person in their life, just severing a relationship seemingly out of the blue. So the INFJ might be best friends with this person, um, or even in a romantic relationship with the person, or acquaintances, what have you, and something happens. Something happens that the other person in the relationship is usually unaware of, and it was sort of like the final straw for the INFJ. The INFJ then slams the door, cutting off all contact altogether, and really never goes back, never allows this person back into their life. Now, I find this so interesting because on the surface, um, if you look around online, it's presented as the INFJ gets into a relationship with someone who is basically toxic. The person takes and takes and takes over time and doesn't give very much back. Um, or the person is manipulative in some way, narcissistic, has some sort of dysfunctional energy pattern going on. And the INFJ really tries to work with it for a long time until finally one day the INFJ has finished processing all the pieces of the relationship, realizes that there's no way they can repair the connection and then cuts it off. Um, so what I find really interesting is that the people who are asking me questions about the INFJ door slam, um, whether it's by email or in my classes, they're all INFJs. I don't get people who have been on the receiving end of a door slam who are like, why did this happen? Or, you know, why is this a strategy INFJs use? It's always INFJs ourselves. I myself, and I'm also an INFJ and I have done this to people in my past. So I have personal experience with this. Um, what I do see online, uh, the, the most often accepted explanation is that the INFJ did this to protect themselves because the person in question was so dysfunctional and so toxic. Now, while I'm not arguing with that side of it, I'm not questioning that point because I do agree that this almost always happens when the other person in the relationship with the INFJ um, is displaying some sort of toxic behavior. However, I think INFJs themselves are so interested in why this happens because we also share responsibility. Now, that's something you really don't see online, and that's what I wanna address today. You don't see a lot of INFJs who step up and say, well, this was actually a 50-50 thing. It takes two to tango. Um, I had to slam the door because of not only their energetic pattern, but my energetic pattern as well. So that's what I really wanna dive into and clear up a little bit today, um, because this is something that so many INFJs struggle with, and I don't think we have a lot of consciousness around it, this issue, so a lot of times we don't even know why we're struggling. We know that we keep attracting people into our lives who are takers, um, and we also even know that a lot of times we have perfectly good people in our lives, but we also go through periods where we suddenly need to withdraw from them. We suddenly need to retreat and we can come off as kind of cold to them or confusing. And that causes a lot of interpersonal issues with our relationships as well. So the thing is, INFJs overall, um, who are unconscious and have not done a whole lot of inner work around being an INFJ, being an intuitive person, being an empath, we have problems with boundaries. That is probably the number one problem I see with the intuitive people that I coach, the intuitive people who are in my classes. We have problems with boundaries. Now, immediately after I say that, so many intuitive people kind of go immediately into self-deprecation or self-judgment. They're like, oh, I know, I've always had trouble with it. I've worked on it in therapy, I suck. This is not about a you suck thing. This is not about like you need to work on boundaries or it's um, like a self-help improvement project. We're not trying to fix anything here and we're not trying to do anything. We're just trying to bring 
conscious awareness to the fact that this is a thing. So the deal is with intuitive people, most people, most normal people who are non-intuitives, okay, um, their energy field is about a foot outside of them at all times. An INFJ or an INFP, our energy field is about 12 feet outside of us. 12 feet. And I really want, as I'm saying that, I really want you to look in all directions and see exactly how far away 12 feet is. That's a long ways away. If you work in an open office plan, if you're a student in a classroom, if you're in a store and it's crowded, if you're at the mall, that 12 feet in all directions, as people are walking by you, you're picking up on their stuff. You have always done this as an intuitive person. This is part of your energetic makeup. You can't stop doing this and there's nothing wrong with this, but it is happening and you can't stop it. So what that means is that from a very early age, um, boundaries to us feel differently than they do to most other people. We are used to having a lot of different people coming in and out of our boundaries. Our boundaries are also very porous and we also can hold a lot of energy in a space. Um, so we end up holding a lot of other people's energy. This also feels normal to us simply because we've never known any other way. Um, when children grow up, you know, we go to elementary school, our parents raise us and we learn, you know, table manners, how to be polite to our elders, history and science and geography. Nobody sits us down and says, okay, let's look at energy fields and relationships and boundaries and how you interact with people and the energetic, you know, give and take exchange that's going on. That's not covered um, by parents or in any school. So INFJ and INFP people who badly need this information never get it. We just grow up assuming this is reality. This is the way the world is. We feel like our boundaries are violated, pushed, stepped on, very porous. This is our normal. So when we show up to relationships, because of our empathy and because of our heart-centered drive in life, um, because of the way we show up in the world, we bring 110% of ourselves to a person in any given moment, especially if we see them in person. It's a little bit less over the phone, it's a little bit less over text, um, but if we are with a person in person, we bring all of our energy to the table. We are fully with them. We make full eye contact. We're paying full attention. We're asking thoughtful, probing questions. We're scanning their energy. We're really with it, with them in that moment. We're really, really there and present. Of course, people love this. This is why INFJs and INFPs, we never really, um, even though we might feel like no one really knows us, we never have a shortage of people who want to be around us and want to talk to us and tell us all their secrets because people really feel that. Now what happens, um, that is how we should be. That's sort of our, like our teacher, mentor, counselor, um, empath, intuitive helper energy showing up. That's all well and good. Um, but when we don't have boundaries to manage that energy, we tend to always overgive. So we overgive our attention. We overgive our time quite frequently. Time is a boundary and it's a boundary many INFJs and INFPs have a problem with and don't know that. Um, so we might meet with someone for a coffee date, really only comfortable with spending about an hour with them. We might be like, oh, I feel a little low energy today. I don't think I can do over an hour. And then we end up at the coffee shop with them for two hours because they're going through a breakup and it seems like they need someone and they just keep talking and we don't feel like we can gracefully exit. So we end up staying two hours instead of one. We have violated our own time boundary. Um, same thing with the intensity of emotion. You know, we might show up at a party, we see someone we know and we're like, oh, I, you know, she's a nice person, but I can't really deal with her. She's a lot. And I know that um, she's going to be kind of a black hole. So I'm not going to let her do that. And then we get in a conversation with that person and, oh, it just feels like she really needs a lot right now. And she's going through something. So we end up, you know, talking to her for a lot of the party and dealing with all of her emotional intensity when we've already decided we just don't have the energetic bandwidth to deal with that this evening. We do this so routinely, it feels normal to us. We go into a situation, 
we know our energy levels, we feel them. Our intuition is telling us, you can only stay one hour, don't talk to that person, um, this isn't a good situation for you, and then we get into the moment and we overstay. We overstay on time, we overstay on our energy, we overgive, and we do it so much that we hit a wall finally, and then we have to suddenly retreat. Even with the people we love, the people who are our best friends, and we have no intention of ever INFJ door slamming them, we still retreat with them, and it's confusing and cold to them because they don't know what's going on. When the INFJ door slam occurs, it is because we've been in a situation where we have been over giving routinely, frequently, constantly, on schedule. This is a pattern, it's a habit with this person. Um, it's a boss that we are not standing up to, we're not saying no to. It's a relationship where the person is a complete narcissist and is just sucking us dry. It's some sort of situation where we are allowing someone else to take everything we have because we are not putting our own needs first. We only have, it's like we wake up every day, we have a certain amount of energy and we allow other people to line up in a queue and take what they want out of our energy bucket before we use the energy that's left over. And then we only use the leftovers. Over time, we get very, very resentful. Now, if someone is routinely showing up at the head of the line and taking half the bucket every day, we actually will continue this pattern for quite a while before we hit the wall and then we door slam them. So the INFJ door slam is protective. It is, um, it is an action of self-preservation, yes. And the person who's been door slammed definitely had some sort of dysfunctional energetic pattern going on. However, as INFJs, we need to take responsibility for our own dysfunctional energetic pattern that we also have going on. If we don't, we will keep INFJ door slamming our entire lives. And at some point, we will actually really believe that it's the fault of everyone else. You know, these people keep coming into our lives, they totally suck, you know, we bend over backwards, why doesn't anybody care about us? The INFJs can really get a good martyr complex going on if we let ourselves. So in order to be most effective and in order to really step into our own power, we have to acknowledge this is our pattern. This is our energy pattern. And you better believe those narcissists out there, those people who are the energy takers, they see you. If you have the overgiving pattern, if you have poor boundaries, they see you. It's not like a magical woo-woo, like, yeah, that's what I brought into my life because I'm attracting that and it's the law of attraction. I'm into the law of attraction. I'm not saying like, that should be dismissed, but I'm saying this has a real concrete physical basis um, in reality. These people see you. They see the way you carry your body. They see the way you speak. They read your facial expressions. They see how you have relationships with other people. They see you do not guard and protect your energy. They see that you say yes much of the time when you would rather say no. Whether they're conscious of it in the case of a real, like, you know, on the extreme end of the spectrum, sociopathic narcissist, who I do think they are conscious of it, to someone who's just kind of a psychic vampire, but pretty unconscious in their own right, wherever they are on the spectrum, they see it. They see how you energetically interact in the world and they go for you. So if you continue this dysfunctional energetic pattern where you let everyone else come in, line up at your energy bucket, you give, 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 and you don't stand in your own power, yes, it will continue. When you shift the energetic pattern, when you reclaim ownership over your energy bucket every single day, and you give your energy to you first, and you do not act out of guilt or obligation, or like, oh, well, I should, or I feel like I'm a bad person, and when you just get all of that crap out of the way, and you say, this is my energy, and I feed myself first, and then I feed the priorities that have value to me, that are most important to me in my life, the energy pattern shifts. And those people who are the takers, the ones who you would have to door slam in the future, you don't even show up on their radar. They don't see you, they don't clock you, they're not attracted to you. If you meet in like an office space or a classroom space or a public space, 
they literally don't see you because of the new way you're holding your body, because of the new way you're verbally speaking, because of the new way your eyes are expressing emotion. All of these things show the energetic pattern we're in. So I say this is controversial because a lot of times when INFJs hear this for the first time, um, it's kind of like a bucket of cold water over them. They don't like it. They're like, no, but it's not my fault. I'm not saying it's anyone's fault. Um, this is not about blame. The blame game is going to be very low vibration and it's going to keep you from shifting because you actually can't do any real work if you're stuck in the blame game. This is not the blame game. This is about seeing what is and seeing if it still works for you or serves you in your life. The more you acknowledge and work with your own energetic patterns, the more power you have as a human being. That's what this is really all about. Um, so one last thing I'd like to say right now, if you sign up for my newsletter, I am giving away my book, Firefly Magic, Heart Powered Marketing for Highly Sensitive Writers, totally free. It's an entire book. Um, you get the ebook online if you sign up for my newsletter. Um, but it's a pretty good book, honestly. Like I wrote it, I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but for INFJs and INFPs who have marketing blocks and feel really weird about putting themselves out there, their writing work, their creative work, what have you, it works. I've had a lot of readers contact me and say things really shifted for me after I read this. Um, it deals with emotional blocks. It deals with resistance. It deals with marketing fantasies. Um, it deals with integrity issues. It deals with all of the things that INFPs and INFJs hate about marketing. Um, it also deals with money and how that's emotionally rooted in your system. So if this is a problem you're dealing with or it sounds interesting to you, go to my website, laurensapala.com. Um, if you go to laurensapala.com slash newsletter, you'll find it right there. Just give me your email address and you got your free copy and you're all set. Um, until then, I'll see you guys next time. Thanks so much.